Well, I bring Ralph here not only uh, uh, to show uh, to show uh, the picture, uh, but uh, to reflect upon uh, the work uh, we did together. He has he shared uh, the platform with me on two uh, previous occasions. Uh, a few years ago, in Boston Eastern Sociological Society. I was asked to do a didactic seminar on participant observation, and it occurred to me that since uh, this was in Boston and Ralph was living next door in Burlington, it uh, might add interest to the session if he and I teamed up, which we did. And I found that this uh, was uh, this went over very well. I am sure that Ralph was the, the star of the occasion, and it went over so well in Boston that we decided to take the show uh, off the road and do it in New York City, which we did at the ASA meeting uh, several months uh, months later. Uh, I'm happy to call on uh, on him now to talk about. Uh, uh, the white impact on an um, underdog. <laughs> the, the white impact on an underdog. That is the theme that I hope to um, focus on during this presentation. Professor William, Foote's White's, Professor William Foote White's work and friendship has had a profound and sustained sociological influence on my career and my behavior for more than 40 years. In order to best explain the impact on my life, I need to introduce my early years prior to when Bill first plotted me in his field research notes as Sam Fr the glasses don't work. <laughs> Prior to when Bill first plotted me in his field research notes as Sam Franco, leader of the Millers, a street corner gang. I was born in the north end of Boston in 1919 in an overcrowded and substandard red brick tenement district, also known as Lit Litley. Since birth and for the next 20 years, I could, be found, I could be found hanging around on street corners with my gang, just looking for something to do. In retrospect, which one of us in the gang, including Pete the Greek, Johnny Blah, Kichi Coney, uh, Three Fingers, Frankie Three Eye, <laughs> could have dreamed that I would be here today? <laughs> here at Cornell University, amid a group of distinguished intellectuals, and I didn't know we were going to have students or, or graduate students. I, I just, I really don't know who my audience is, except that I know we have social scientists in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, the bill is a nationally, of course, as you all know, a nationally renowned, renowned sociologist, a pioneer in the field of management studies, and the author of the classic uh, uh, Street Corner Society, in which my gang played a small part. Prior to Bill's penetration of the North End, the district was considered by outsiders a disorganized and dangerous slum where crime and disease constantly lurked. During that period, I was well aware of this degrading status and often at night agonized over it when I tried to fall asleep. To further describe the climate, I need to mention some historical events of injustice which had fanned the flames of prejudice. Attorney General Palmer's infamous and politically motivated raids on the homes of suspected immigrant radicals in the Boston area. Police Chief David C. Hennessy was murdered in New Orleans. And brutishly, a large number of Italian immigrants were dragged off the streets and thrown in jail. A mob of about 5,000 stormed the police station and at random lynched 11 Italians. The leader of the mob was subsequently elected mayor. A 50-foot-high iron tank containing 2,300,000 gallons of molasses exploded, sending a 15-foot tidal wave across Commercial Street on the North End. In its rampage, 21 people were smothered to death, 40 more injured, dirty horses killed, elevated structures, six buildings, and a Navy ship destroyed. 
Immediately, the blame was placed on the Italian immigrants in the North End as an anarchist bomb, and not the fact that the molasses standpipe had been constructed with thinner steel plates than specified in the plans of the Boston Commission. Now, this was proved in court six years later, and there were involved hearings, uh, the hearings involved 119 damage suits. After Sacco and Vanzetti were executed in the electric chair, they were placed in coffins side by side in Langoni's funeral parlor on Hanover Street in the North End. While my mother held one of my hands, I touched Sacco and Vanzetti and made the sign of the cross. And most of the people in the audience, the massive audience around us, that were in tears. Condescension and scorn was described by Senator Henry Carrot Lodge, relevant to the newly arrived Italian immigrants as belonging to, and I quote, races with whom the English-speaking people have never assimilated and are alien to the great body of people in the United States. Now, on top of this, the North then had its own scars, and some of which, some of which, or all of them, helped distort the true image of the North End so that you can better appreciate the challenge facing Bill White. Let me, let me uh, uh, describe some of these things that overshadowed the, the true, the real world in the North End. During Prohibition, two of my father's five brothers, Uncles Filicillo and Chicopapa Orlandella, were bootleggers in the North End. Uncle Filicillo lived across the street from Cesaro and Julo, the latter in a legitimate grocery business who at the time was also thriving. Their family grave sites abutted Holy Cross Cemetery, and the same sculptor designed the massive and costly granite monuments. Cesaro and Julo had five sons, one of them named Jerry, who was my age. I went to school with Jerry through the North End all the way to Michelangelo High, through, through Michelangelo High. Jerry and Julo was always friendly, well-mannered, outspoken, intelligent, and impeccable dresser and occasionally shot around the narrow, 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 narrow streets in the late model sports car. Today, Jerry is a multi-millionaire businessman with extensive real estate holdings and still has an office on Prince Street in the North End. He is also portrayed as the alleged boss of organized crime in Massachusetts and the number two in the New England Mafia. Jerry's only sister, Stella, married in Orlandella. On April 29, 1980, the FBI told the Senate Permanent Investigations Committee that relying on murder to maintain power, the Mafia thrived in 20, 20 metropolitan areas, and I'm quoting this, including the Boston, Providence, Rhode Island area, on the nine bosses who comprise the National Commission, the largest and most powerful. Now, the North End did indeed have a bad reputation, and that this, plus the status as immigrants or children of immigrants, of Italian immigrants gave me a strong feeling of, look, of being looked down on by others in a more favored economic and political strata. Little wonder I developed an inferiority complex when interacting with my Irish school teachers and other outsiders. In fact, it was the main, one of the main reasons why I was a high school dropout in my senior year. Now, at this point, I've developed a sinister and an animal-like scenario. However, as White said in Street Corner Society, there is one thing wrong with such a picture. No human beings are in it. <laughs> it was under this background that I first met Bill White in 1939, when I was 20 years of age, and Bill was on a Harvard fellowship conducting a study in the North End. Almost immediately, I found myself working informally with Bill with the hope that the research would help outsiders better understand what really made the North End tick and its needs. Now, what I learned from Bill was a set of methods for making a systematic study of street corner gangs based on observing, interviewing, figuring out social networks, and informal leadership. I also observed and analyzed the dynamics of group processes and identified the informal leader through discovering how collective action originated for the group. And for the first time in my life, the first time in my life, I was no longer hanging on the street corner looking for something to do. Yes, Bill White turned my life completely around. He expanded my thinking so that I could better understand and appreciate the North End, the structure and the social patterns, that in spite of its ugly image as a slum, it was well organized in a sociological sense. Okay, I, I learned that, in fact, 
that bad reputation of the North End was based entirely on a very few individuals who were involved in violence or lawlessness. A case in point, my father had worked in a shoe factory for 15 years, and during the, during the Depression, the factory was closed. He never, he never attempted to work with my two wealthy uncles nor ask him for financial aid. My mother would not even let us discuss anything illegal in the house. What I'm really saying is that my parents were typical, my family was typical of the families in the North End, poor, honest, and proud. Now beyond the number, the small number of people involved in organized crime, the North End was a very peaceable district with its close-knit family ties within a teeming mass of cohesive and formal groups. That filo mio, mangiare, mangiare, son, eat, eat, was standard courtesy in our homes, whether we were family, relative, paisano, or outsider with even the slightest connection. That we experienced a general high degree of personal safety and security in the North End, both day and night, and robbery and vandalism against homes and business were almost non-existent. That loyalty to the street corner gangs was surpassed only by devotion to family, and that when, a, when, and that when family and country were threatened by outside forces, the Italian Americans were the largest ethnic group in the nation to have served during World War II. That we made it, yes, we made it. We made it in overcrowded and substandard housing, mostly cold water flats with outside toilets, no bathtubs, refrigerators, elevators, or porches, only rat infested cellars and dangerous rooftops as play areas. And on top of this, language barriers, social injustice, and poverty. And yet we made it. In other words, what we really, in other words, we really had something going for us in the North End, with a certain culture, color, and warmth, and a living network of family, relatives, and friends. And these family traits, these customs, these values, helped us to cope with adversity. So you see, my new perspective about life in the North End had a deeper and a more intimate meaning than the common theme, which crops up again and again as young people striving to overcome discrimination reach back to their cultural heritage to try to ensure themselves that they did not descend from a bunch of bums. Probably most important to me was the realization, oh, one thing I need to say there, just think, I had never heard of the common theme until I learned this from Bill. In fact, before Bill found me in the streets, the word sociology was not in my vocabulary. <laughs> And I don't do this every day, you know. <laughs> I'll tell you what, after seeing Regan and Kyle, it doesn't, it really, I should. Think <laughs> <laughs> I got to lose. <laughs> Probably most important to me was the regulate was the realization that in all reality, I said regulation, that's because of my military background. Probably most important to me was the realization that in all reality, our poor immigrant parents and children had enough guts and drive to overcome the pains, overcome the pains of prejudice when they were beaten down under the brunt of a great historical injustice. And refused, they refused to be suffocated by oppression which was then bound to almost every facet of corporate and personal politics. Now this kind of thinking, a spin-off from my research, was automatic. It came to me without any further inspiration from Bill. As a direct result, I was able to break away from the shackles of an inferiority complex that had shackled me and dominated me for more than 20 years. However, it could not have happened without working for Bill. And hence, I stopped hanging around the street corners just looking for something to do. Now, at this point, as a direct result of Bill's influence, I presented several factors which affected my perception and values. Next, I need to explain how this knowledge was put into action. Soon after Bill left us, we were engulfed by World War II, and this broke up our corner gangs, our street corner gangs and clubs. But little did I realize at the time that my learning outcomes gained from Bill would be functionally tested as a non-commissioned officer, that's an NCO, in the Marines, in the Air Force, and finally in civilian life as superintendent of public works in Burlington, Massachusetts. Stated another way, my full career record strongly attests that Bill gave me a sociological insurance policy which protected me the rest of my life. And I'll prove that. 
Beyond the not inexperienced, my experiments were based on informal social skills developed under Bill, and not as having received formal instruction in management methods or management systems. However, I improved the social skills by reading books on management and taking some night courses when I was in the military service. And then I was able to put this information, this, this, this background, into, the form, into, into the, an action framework with the things learned from Bill. Even though Bill never gave me any formal instruction in interviewing, he spent much of our time together interviewing me. And I picked up from him the pattern that he let me go beyond general expressions of attitudes to, towards descriptions of concrete events. And this was very, very important. In other words, later on, on my own, I used Bill techniques and, I, and a few innovations on my, of my own. My interview and behavior in the military service, for example, was simple. So to help diagnose a morale problem on an Air Force base, I would hang around where airmen and NCOs worked, gather to socialize and gripe. This included participation in NCO problem solving advisory boards. I found that I was able to fit in with the men so that I got them or helped them to talk freely with me and at times let my own personality hang out even if it meant arguing with them so that they would express their thoughts and feelings on their problems in such a way that I could figure out the problem quickly. Later in civilian life, I used a similar techniques in the role of superintendent of public works. And one of my favorite ones was, to, a, a favorite setup I had was to get an informal leader to have a coffee break with, with me with his, with his immediate supervisor. Now, relative to action research, I intervened when it was deemed in the best interest of the subjects for this helped me develop a, a mutually supportive relationship between us, between me and the subject, or subjects. I never attempted to pay an informant for information, and I would say the term flexibly structured best describes my general interview and approach when I was in the field. Now for the remainder of this talk, when reference is made to the role of troubleshooter, it means the ability to diagnose problems or to recommend a solution or to implement corrective action. The incident which, best, which probably best describes what Bill meant to me happened in February 1944 when the 22nd Marines of the 5th Amphibious Corps invaded Enuitak Atoll, a highly fortified Japanese imperial stronghold in the Marshall Islands. We were aboard the USS Middleton and attack transport. Three months, three months earlier, this very ship had participated in a bloodbath during the assault of Tarara, a tiny V-shaped atoll, where more than 1,000 Marines of the 2nd Marine Division were killed. And now it was our turn to make a direct frontal assault. During the bombardment of Inuitok, I never experienced, I never experienced the more supremely agonizing anxiety and suspense than the excruciating torture of those moments when the chaplain announced there was a ship's PA system for all Marines to kneel down in prayer. Now this took place aboard the USS Middleton just seconds before we received the signal to go over the ship's rail to board our assigned landing craft. Simultaneously, the tempo of the bombardment increased. The close sea and air support was a hurricane of flame, steel, and fire, which permeated the air with a strong explosive order of diesel fuel. In a rolling barrage, battleships, cruisers, destroyers, rocket ships, a host of smaller ships, Navy and Marine aircraft, shell bombed and strafed the atoll in a relentless attack. The tremors and noise sounded like sustained thunderclap or kettle, dr kettle drums magnified a million times. The tension inside of me mounted with the intensity of the operation. A new sensation gripped me with a wild, desperate feeling in the depth of my stomach. It was at this very incident that a flashback of my whole world, my whole world came before my eyes. My wife Rose, my parents, and Bill White. When an M1 slung over my shoulder, I went over the rail and started down the rope net stretched along the side of the ship. My muscles became so tense from the strain that I couldn't feel my grip on the rungs, on the rope rungs of the, of the rope ladder as I lowered myself toward the landing barge, which looked like a cork bobbing in the rough water below. When I made it to the assault craft, everyone aboard appeared to be moving into a prone position with ashen faces like mask-like robots. Then the coxswain revved the engine and we started out to, to begin the assault in the first wave. 
and quickly we were in the center of a powerful yet awesome force. As we lay down on the bottom of the craft, I checked the safety on my rifle and assured that my bayonet was in place and thought to myself, I will never see my loved ones again nor ever get to read Bill's book. <laughs> The book came out while I was on my way overseas. <laughs> and in my last contact with Bill, prior to ship it out, advised him that where I was going, I couldn't take books. So Bill sent the book to my wife, Rose, in the North End. Now it came to pass that I did not receive Street Corner Society until months later after I administered the last rites aboard the USS Middleton, the Marshall Islands secured and finally transferred from a temporary stay in, you know, in the Navy Hospital in Hawaii to the, the Navy Hospital in San Diego, California. That's where Rose mailed, mailed the book and, and a cover letter told me that she had carefully wrapped it and placed it in her hope chest where it was to stay until I returned. Bill had never shown me any drafts of the book, so that when I read it, I was amazed that anyone outside of the North End, outside of that an outsider, could truly capture the real inside of the North End. And since I could not go home to Rose and my family, the book brought the rest of the North End to me in San Diego when I needed it most. Even while recovering in the hospital, Bill White was there. The feedback in the form of a published book in which I played a small part pushed my interest in sociology to a new high. For example, when PFC Dom Zucchini came around as part of a marine detail to pay us emergency pay, I readily picked him up as on, on, his, on his informal leadership traits, even though he was, even though a technical sergeant outranked him was in charge of the detail. Soon I found myself working with Dom in a volunteer patient status in the Marine Guard Detachment, where I also observed Corporal Bob Nofsinger as another informal leader type. In no time flat, in the largest naval hospital during World War II, we were practically, practically running the detachment, which was responsible for the administration of hundreds of Marine casualties returning from combat areas. Our commander, Captain Fred, uh, Frank Spud Murphy, would informally seek us out to resolve unique administrative and personnel problems, and in doing so, bypass the senior NCOs and his fellow officers and his subordinate officers. After World War II, as a first sergeant, I carried out field experiments in leadership and group processes in the regular sessions of the Marine Corps Reserve training sessions of the Marine Corps Reserve in Boston. In these cases, I would call on Marine A to pick four men and carry out an assignment, keeping in mind my own observations and predictions regarding who associated with whom and how efficiently the group accomplished the task. The task. In these tests, I alternated between individuals identified as informal leaders and those as followers. In observing the process later, I found that there was an enormous difference in the performance of the group put together by the follower. The task took longer, showed more confusion and conflict in working out the assignment than was the case with, with the group under the informal leader. And from such experiments, I drew conclusions about networks or interpersonal relations about informal leadership. At the start of the Korean conflict, I was very depressed. Now we're going into the third, let's see, the second war. At the start of the Korean conflict, I was very depressed because I had to leave Rose again this time with two small sons. I remember telling Bill that a Marine had no right to expect to survive one war and then come through a second war alive. At the time, I was a first sergeant assigned to the six Marines in the regular Marine Corps at Camp Lejeune. One particular morning, which I have never forgotten, my men were loading the Jeep with our sea bags and we were shipping out. When suddenly a Jeep pulled up and the, and the, the driver, an NCO, told me that I was wanted at the battalion headquarters as soon as possible to grab my sea, sea bag and jump aboard. I did this, and I, I said, you know, what's the story? He says, I have no other information. So I turned around, I looked at my men, waved at them, and I never saw them again. All I could figure out was that some first sergeant got knocked off in Korea, and they were going to rush me overseas as his replacement. <coughs> in a long-distance call to Bill, which he remembers, I made in an, in an excited voice. I said, Bill, it's just like the movies. Yesterday I received orders to ship out to Korea, and today I got a message from higher headquarters redirecting that I be assigned a report to the Air University at Maxwell Air Force Base on detached duty. Now this unprecedented loan of a Marine working directly for the Air Force was initiated and followed up by Bill. 
and had to be approved by the commanding generals of both the Marines and the Air Force. <laughs> At Air University, I was the first and only enlisted man ever to be assigned as a principal investigator to a, a Human Resources Research Institute government-funded project. It was entitled Military Discipline. And also on several occasions, I was sent out with two or three colleagues to different air bases where, where, that were reported to have a serious morale problem and needed help on figuring out the problem. On such occasion, I was able to go in there and within a few days arrive at a solid diagnosis of the nature of the problem and suggest a set of remedial steps. Now, these type of efforts helped establish a troubleshooter image for me. The executive, for example, and I'm going to quote the Executive Office of Psychological Warfare Directive at the Air University. In a study of air-based community relations in France and Morocco, it is necessary that the field team conduct interviews with the airmen of three bases in France and one in Africa. The unique interviewing skills of Sergeant Allendella would be a vital asset to the field team. The University of North Carolina Chapel Hill Weekly, said, uh, Weekly Letter said it this way, Ralph has been on the job for about a week now, and he is turning up a lot of data on critical incidents in a maintenance squadron which few civilian observers would be sensitized to, sensitized to or could in fact actually get. He has plenty of experience in military observations and has some good training thanks to Bill White at Cornell. At Vandenberg Air Force Base with the Strategic Air Command, I was credited, and I'm going to quote, for the development of Atlas ICBM training courses and for development of on-the-job training programs for missile men where none existed before and for which there was an urgent need, and that these efforts were instrumental in assisting the 576th in becoming the first operational ICBM Atlas in the Strategic Command, Air Command and in the United States Air Force. Now, what is not mentioned in the award are the sociological aspects which were involved, such as how we identified the problems, interviewed, selected, and motivated a group of military and civilian personnel towards, towards working towards the development of a training program, a sensitive and, and a highly technical program. Now, the group included informal leaders and technical representatives from Convey Astronautics, Rocketdyne, General Electric, and Burroughs. Now, I ask you, how in the world how in the world could a corner gang leader who was found in the streets be able to successfully organize and control such a group to work on a highly technical requirement or for that matter just find himself physically involved? The answer has to be Bill White. <laughs> At Westover Air Force Base, I held the positions of superintendent of all in-resident 8th Air Force leadership schools, also in SAC, the Strategic Air Command. And I was chairman of the 8th Air Force Commanders and the Advisory Board of SAC for seven years. These roles afforded me maximum opportunities to apply some of White's ideas in the areas of leadership and management, and especially the business about the informal leader. In my eighth and final year at Westover, I was reassigned to another command-wide position as 8th Air Force Career Motivation NCO for the Strategic Air Command. And I'm saying these things. It sounds like an eagle trip, but this is the only way I can tell you the kind of an impact that this man made on me. This professor made on me. <laughs> My learned social skills were also applied in Japan. The wing training officer of the 67 tactical reconnaissance wing documented as follows. The approach and techniques used by Allendella, whether he was, he should say, used by Bill White, whether he was briefing squadron commanders, supervisors, trainees, and so forth, were enlightening, highly successful, and a demonstration of skillful human relations at work. During the Vietnam War, my troubleshooter techniques and social skills were invaluable to me in the roles of personnel sergeant major and base sergeant major of the 56th Combat Support Group at Nakhon Phnom, that's also called NKP, a clandestine base in Northern Ireland. I won't go into that, and I'll, and I'll give you another big period here, which I'll do in one sentence. Upon completion of my overseas assignment, I was reassigned to the Air Force Communications Service at Scott Air Force Base, where I retired in grade of Chief, Chief Master Sergeant and, and, and a new position the Air Force created called Personnel Executive Officer in 1970. I bring that in because two months later, I started a second career in, in, I started a second career in Burlington, Massachusetts. 
They have another seven-year track record of applied sociological techniques <coughs> attest to their value when appropriately utilized for handling management and organizational problems. The town's board of selectmen hired me as a troubleshooter. They never saw me before. It was strictly on my military record. I never saw the selectmen before. To assist the superintendent of public works reorganize and consolidate the Department of Public Works, the DPW. The agencies under its jurisdiction included the water distribution and sanitary sewer systems, the engineering department, the planning board agent, the highway division, the cemetery division, and the administrative section, a multi-million dollar program. The following are some of the critical factors which reflected a high degree of disorganization and an immediate need for corrective action. Continuous and confused changes in administrative direction, low morale, excessive personnel and patronage problems, unsatisfactory budget preparation and cost accounting controls, backlog of funded priority construction projects, need for expansion of the water and sewage systems, salt contaminated wells, and I got a list, a, a shopping list, so I'll just skip the rest of them. It goes on and on and on, and a complete breakdown, the last one, in, in a complete breakdown in communications with the other town service agencies. Now, the opportunity for me to look good as a troubleshooter are unlimited. With rights, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute, in a second, with white sociological insurance policy in my back pocket, I was promoted within three months from administrative assistant to the highway superintendent, where I also gained fair, uh, field experience, to, to highway superintendent. Did I say that right? Yeah. I was promoted from administrative assistant to highway superintendent. Three months later, I was again promoted to the top job in the town of Burlington, superintendent of public works, and the highest paying job at Burlington. And I held it for approximately seven years, and my predecessors, five of them never held it for one year. <laughs> one of the research actions taken during this period was the observation of subordinates in informal interactions both on and off the job from which informal leaders surfaced and then go on to place them in formal supervisory positions. These actions were accomplished in spite of mind-boggling civil service requirements. <laughs> they wanted to put me in jail at one time. Probably <laughs> made a headline too in Boston. Probably most important, <laughs> in jail, probably most important, <laughs> I was working so hard, probably, <laughs> it's crazy. Probably most important was the need to recognize the structure of the official bodies, such as the Board of Selectmen, my five bosses, Ways and Means, the town meeting members, special interest groups such as the townies and the local wealthy contractors. But once this was figured out, I worked hard at gaining their confidence and support of the leadership which emerged. And well aware it was not good enough, simple, not good enough to simply relate to individuals in terms of their formal positions. In this way, I was able to protect myself and advance the DPW program more effectively. I must have had something going for me. It could not, not have been done alone, especially if you consider some of the actions and changes that took place under my administration in a highly political town. I rocked the boat and was abrasive and non-cooperative when confronted with patronage pressures. Hit hard when contractors, industry, or utility companies were responsible for the substandard construction or damage to town property, and in each case, the town was compensated. For example, Exxon, Exxon, I got $17,000 from them without, without lawyers. It was a very simple oil break in the town. Without lawyers, I was able to get $17,000 plus $7,000 for an engineering study and a few other things. <laughs> I fired a force retired incompetent personnel. And some part, other, and other things were part, introduced and developed job training standards, additional duty and cross training to improve efficiency and afford upward mobility. That goes on, established incentive awards, and I got another big shopping list here. And, and, and for snow and ice control, it was a, this one I want at least this one I want to get in. On snow and ice control, because our wells were being contaminated, I come up, I developed what we call the sixth zone supervisory concept, in which I used informal leaders, and for three years. We're the only town in the United States in any kind of a winter belt that, that, that attacked snow and ice without salt for three consecutive years, and we did not have one fatality. As a matter of fact, that was a, a national magazine published the entire thing, but I guess some towns believe they got a barrel of salt and barrel of salt, and they still do it. And during the same period, construct a four-point... Five million dollar dollar water treatment plant and reservoir completed a seventeen million dollar 
sanitary sewer system and the Tom Stormwater Management Plan. I just got one more card. <laughs> All of this and much more without increasing the workforce and with a lower budget and cost per capita than any of the comparable towns around Berlin. That's right. We did it, and we did it without the need to process a single union of Municipal Employees Association grievance beyond my desk. Most problems were resolved at weekly staff meetings in my office with key supervisory personnel, which more than often included the informal leaders. So you see, the sociological benchmarks tell the story of Bill's profound influence on an underdog. He found me hanging around street corners just looking for something to do and turned the life of meaningless existence into a meaningful career. The key to it all was the training received, the feedback, well fortified with friendship. This longtime association included Kathleen, who also encouraged and guided me. Yes, I met Bill and Kathleen when I was 20 years old. In a few months, I'll be 62, and that's how long our friendship has continued. Thank you, Bill and Kathleen. It was an honor to have known both of you and to be here today among your distinguished colleagues and friends. On behalf of my family and my parents, who I'm sure are probably looking at us from somewhere up there, grazie, Dante Migi, molte grazie.